Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Wu and the organizing committee for their initiative in organizing and maintaining the AACO ophthalmology lecture series. And I sincerely hope to proceed with these fruitful and very informative online lectures for the benefit of ophthalmologists worldwide. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the new classifications of congenital corneal uh, opacities. The classification system of congenital corneal opacification, CCO, may be better considered from a perspective of pathogenesis, surgical intervention, and prognosis. Primary CCO includes corneal dystrophies and choristomas presenting at birth. Secondary CCO may be best considered as cases of keratoiridolenticular dysgenesis killed and other secondary causes, including infection, aetrogenic developmental anomalies of the iridotrabecular system or lens or both, and developmental anomalies of the adnexum. Clinical phenotype should be augmented by anterior segment imaging OCT or high frequency ultrasound or histology or both. Although such a classification may be helpful to remember all the etiologies involved, it is unhelpful to help understand possible pathogenesis or which cases of CCO are likely to do well with surgical intervention, particularly penetrating keratoplasty. Describing a developmental corneal opacity as being Peter's anomaly is akin to diagnosing someone with a respiratory problem as having a cough. It is neither precise, diagnostic, nor informative about prognosis. The contemporary classification includes uh, classifying the CCO into primary and secondary. Uh, the primary uh, would include corneal dystrophies, dermoid, and sclerocornea, while the secondary will be divided into those due to killed and those, to, due, those due to other causes. In the killed uh, category, the lens may either fail to separate from the cornea, which is either developmental or mechanical, or the lens separates but fails to form thereafter or the lens fails to form initially. PHPV is also included in this category. Now, other causes of secondary uh, con congenital corneal opacities will include infection, iatrogenic developmental anomalies of iridotrabecular system, and developmental anomalies of adnexa. Primary congenital opacities will include two entities, which are the congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy and the posterior polymorphous dystrophy. They both may coexist with glaucoma. They both present at birth. Now, on UBM scan, we can see that the uh, chest is characterized by the thick stroma. The anterior chamber is free and is normal. Now, in the posterior polymorphous dystrophy scan of, under UBM, that we can see that there is thick, irregular decimal endothelial complex, and again, the anterior chamber is normal. They both respond very well to surgical outcome, especially penetrating keratoplasty. Dermoid is a choristoma of the cornea. It may be associated with golden heart syndrome and may be removed by shaving or lamellar keratoplasty. Sclerocornea may be isolated, complex, or total. Now, the isolated, isolated, uh, par, po, uh, the isolated type is maybe associated with cornea plana. The complex type may be associated with microphthalmus, cataract, or infantile glaucoma. And the total type may be considered as keratolenticular dysgenesis due to iris lens disruption. Secondary congenital corneal opacities due to keratoiridolenticular dysgenesis 
uh, and lens failure to separate from cornea may be developmental or mechanical. Mutations in FOXE3, the human analog, have been described in one individual with a diagnosis of Peter's anomaly. This is actually too imprecise. Figure one showing disruption of the lens with keratoiridolenticular dysgenesis killed. There is no anterior uh, capsule echo discernible here. You can see that. On the basis of UBM and clinical appearances, it is much more likely that the case in figure one would have a Fox E3 mutation rather than the case in figure two. Both cases may be termed as having Peter's anomaly. Now the mechanical cause may be either due to hypoxia or due to physical delay. Hypoxia and other in insults may cause increased vascular permeability, transudation, and adhesion of this membrane to the cornea resulting in damage to the semis membrane and corneal endothelium. The case in figure three may be explained in this manner. Similarly, there are cases of keratolenticular adhesion which are due to physical delay in separation with an essentially normal uh, lens and normal cornea, otherwise as seen in cases in figure four. Note the area of keratolenticular adhesion, the white arrow here and here. And I read the corneal adhesions, the, dot, the dotted arrow here. Lens and iris are essentially normal in this case. This is likely to be due to mechanical touch. The characteristic features of such mechanical touch is a lack of corneal vascularization. Now, if the lens separates but fails to form thereafter, the figure here shows a case of a child diagnosed as having sclerocornea. The UBM evaluation shows disruption of the lens and iris, suggesting that this is likely to be failure of the lens to form properly, although it appears from the UBM that it has separated from the cornea. PTEX3 has been implicated as a gene mutations in which may result in a condition called anterior segment mesenchymal this genesis. Uh, primary aphakia is extremely rare in humans. Fox E3 may be implicated in congenital primary aphakia. The cornea in these cases seems to have a typical appearance of a silver blue color. All cases treated with PKP results in phthisis bulbi due to formation of cicatricial membrane. Congenital corneal opacity may be associated with persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous. It is unclear whether the pathogenesis is due to mechanical forward pushing of the lens or not. Herpes simplex keratitis may present at birth. Infection may be acquired during passage through the birth canal. However, in some cases, the mother has been found to be negative on microbiological testing. Prognosis may be poor, of course, due to the risk of amblyopia. Examination under anesthetic is needed to establish diagnosis by corneal scrapings. Topical and systemic acyclovir are often needed. Iatrogenic causes for secondary uh, congenital corneal opacities may be due either to amniocentesis or forceps injury. Amniocentesis injury may be difficult to differentiate from CCO because of the total corneal opacity. While forceps injury, there is a history of difficult labor and the linear shape of the opacity is quite remarkable. Now, primary infantile glaucoma as one of the manifestations of congenital corneal uh, opacities uh, 
Most cases of primary infantile glaucoma are detected relatively early. And although a child may present with corneal haze, it is very unusual for a child to present late after with neglected congenital glaucoma. PKP may be needed in case of early corneal opacity. The prognosis for corneal graft survival in such cases is directly dependent on the success of glaucoma control. Now, mutations of CYP1B1 are known to cause primary infantile glaucoma. Primary infantile glaucoma may be caused by a failure of fenestration of primordial endothelial cells. Extension of such abnormal primordial endothelium may cause the anterior surface of the iris to become adherent to the inner surface of the cornea resulting in a congenital corneal opacity. Recently, mutations in CYP1B1 have been reported to cause Peters anomaly. Classification of this type of CCO due to mutations of CYP1B1 gene as a secondary due to primary infantile glaucoma or as part of the killed category needs further evaluation. Pax6 mutations are known to cause aniridia and cases of Peters anomaly have been described to have mutations in Pax6 also. Congenital corneal opacities may be associated with aniridia and aniridia can also, of course, be associated with anterior polar or pyramidal cataracts, which can cause keratolenticular adhesions and often discrete focal CCO. Prognosis for PKP in cases associated with aniridia, again, is dependent on the need for vitreol lensectomy at the time of PKP and the onset of glaucoma, both of which are poor. If a child with congenital corneal opacity has aniridia, anterior polar cataract, and nystagmus, a Pax6 mutation may well be expected, but if none of these other ocular features are present, then a Pax6 mutations may not be expected. A mutation in PTEX2 and FOXC1 have been described to cause Axenfield River anomaly or syndrome, as well as Peters anomaly. The association of CCO and marked posterior embryotoxone may indicate mutations of these genes. It is not known why most cases of Axenfield River anomaly are not associated with corneal opacities. Associated glaucoma may aggravate the prognosis. Corneal ictasia is an intraocular disruption with concomitant intrauterine glaucoma resulting in a grossly enlarged cornea with stretched limbus. The presence of vascularization is again evidence of a non-corneal effect or event that has led to an insult to the cornea or corneal development. Developmental anomalies of the adnexia are characterized by the cleftic eye syndrome, which includes congenital corneal opacities, disruption of the anterior chamber, and this is, of course, beyond surgical repair. Now, to summarize, many studies have described the outcome of surgery in Peters anomaly and sclerocornea over the last 100 years. Using these terms is misleading to determine the surgical outcome. By using the new classification, it should be better to configure genotype-phenotype correlation in order to improve our understanding of the surgical outcome. It is mandatory to define the phenotype of CCO by UBM or anterior segment OCT before attempting surgery. Thank you.